Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's the Champions Chess Tour Finals, and we are down to the last two. Magnus Carlsen versus Wesley So will compete for $200,000 as a first place prize. Second place, not so shabby. They're going to win 100 grand. Uh, we are live here from Toronto. We're not live. This is a recap video that I will be making for all of you. This was day number one. They will play multiple sets, and then we will crown the winner of the Champions Chess Tour 2023. It's been a really fun time here in Toronto. Uh, I've been doing a handful of media. There is a uh, live fan zone for the finals as well, not too far uh, from the playing venue. That's organized by the Chess Bros. I was earlier... Uh, I was there earlier today. It's incredible stuff. Also, yesterday I made my recap super late and my brain wasn't functioning. And I called the CBC radio host who interviewed me, Matt Turner, for some reason. His name is Matt Galloway. Turner and Galloway, I'm not even sure they have an overlapping letter. Matt Turner is the soccer or football player for Nottingham Forest. I don't know why I was thinking of Matt Turner, but uh, that was really funny. I, 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 I realized that like after I made my video. Anyway, that's all to say that uh, don't, you know, don't work 12 hours and then make a chess recap. It's Magnus Carlsen. It's Wesley So. And I am so excited uh, to be sharing this with all of you. Um, I have been, uh, I've been popping into the live chat during the streams. And uh, I do just have to say that I tremendously appreciate those of you that pop into the recap. And even though the, the, the YouTube videos recently have just been a bunch of comments like Levy never fails to put chess in his videos and Levy never fails to put Levi in his videos and Levy never fails to put Gotham chess in his vi Like, I don't know where that came from, but I am enjoying the comments on YouTube videos. Live chat comments are brutal. I mean, my goodness, you would think that people just hate everybody on screen. It, it is really wild stuff. Anyway... They are going to play four rapid games, and if the score is tied 2-2, two to two, they're going to play an Armageddon. Or they're going to play three games, because someone's going to win 3-0. Wesley opens up with B3. That's a surprise. Our match gets started in a very spicy way. You will notice Wesley lost seven seconds on move one. That's because when the clock was started, Wesley took off his glasses, and then took off his ring, and then played B3, which was very funny. Now, Magnus actually spent 40 seconds on the first move. Magnus spent 40 seconds on the first move of the game, which is really interesting. That is really interesting. It's not that he, it, it, it was shock. I mean, it was a little bit of shock value. The thing is, you can enter these really sharp and complicated lines like we saw yesterday with Wesley playing against Nodjerbeck, where there's this, you know, black puts the bishop in front of the D pawn, white tries to put the knight there, black plays knight a5, like... Magnus is deciding, does he go for that? Does he play a reverse London? Reverse London is very, very good opening with the black pieces. But no, he plays g6 and knight f6. He also could have started with knight f6 first, uh, but bishop b2 is what he plays, and now he goes here. Now, there is a very sharp line here for white, which is actually taking this knight, damaging black structure, and then trying to play without a bishop. Position actually kind of resembles a Trumpowski, because in the Trumpowski attack, you play bishop g5, and then you take on f6. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's not, that's not what he plays. Instead, he just plays c4, and Magnus goes for a double Fianchetto setup. So Magnus is actually playing for a position where he will put both his bishops on g7 uh, and b7, whereas Wesley is probably just going to play, like, not e4, but he's going to play like that. It's a very non-confrontational position. It's, it's kind of now an English opening, if you will, because white played c4, so we kind of have a transposition, and then... In this position, Wesley makes a pretty big decision. Uh, he, he thinks for a little while here, and rather than developing the knight here or the knight here or e3, bishop d3, which is basically what I would do, and I mean just, he, he plays this. He plays g3. So we are actually going to have four bishops on g2, b2, b7, g7. So both guys developing their bishops to the little houses. Fianchetto is what they're doing. Bishop here, bishop here, and castles. A very tense position has arisen. Because white has a tiny bit more space in the center of the board, but I'm not really sure it's exploitable. And I mean, in chess, both sides are going to clash. That's what's going to happen. Uh, and what I mean by that is white is probably going to go for d5, or black is going to play d5, c5. Black cannot spend the whole game playing on three out of the eight ranks, right? That the Black just can't play like that. Black's going to have to put something physically into the center, like the way white has right now. Uh, that is controlled, and that is looking quite nice. Knight to a6 is a, is a flank move. You're trying to go knight b4. You're trying to play a5, a4. Uh, but at some point, you're also going to have to move one of these pawns forward. Wesley still kind of playing quite tense 
tentatively E3 a normal move, but Wesley's spending, look how much time he's spending, right? Wesley spent three minutes playing G3. Like, that's the sign of a hesitant chess player. Because you don't need to spend three, you don't need to spend like, what percent is three out of 13? I can't really do math that well. Um, but uh, it's probably something like, uh, you know, 17%. How many threes go into 13? Four and a little bit more than that? Well, it's actually quite sizable, right? So uh, it's like 23% maybe. I mean, you don't need to spend 23% of your time. Let me, you know what? I'm, I'm, this is going to bother me. Hey, Siri, what's three divided by 13? Oh, 23, 0. Look at that. Your favorite chess YouTuber isn't completely brain dead. I just did mental math on the fly. You know how much pressure there is to not look like a complete bozo on camera and then doing mental math? I had to, like, anyway. So that's all to say that you really shouldn't spend three minutes developing on the sixth move of the game. And so by the time Magnus just plays a pawn to the center, Wesley's down four minutes. This is a this is a very tentative Wesley. So you know if this was day one or two of the event, he's playing a random guy in the event. He's gonna he's gonna be moving faster. He's gonna be moving a little bit more confidently. But the position is still fine. It's very balanced. The, both guys bring their rooks, and now Magnus, there we go, has occupied the center with those D and C pawns, and it's it, it's a very very balanced position now. What white should do here to play for an advantage is to take the pawn. Because then black has to make a big decision. Does he join his pawns together? Does he play with the isolated pawn? White's best plan here oftentimes is to then drive the knight out this way to put pressure or drive the knight out to f4 to put pressure there. It's a very, or, or even knight b5 because now there's no c pawn. You kind of stop knight c7. Maybe you'll play a4 and bishop a3 to put some pressure on this pawn. But it's a complex game. But Wesley plays here first and... You know, is is sort of he he allows the knight in a little bit, kind of being annoying. And the point is that the knight stops White's knight from retreating. So now rook a1 and a6, and Magnus sort of solves his problems. You know, Wesley's going to get the knight on a2. We have a little bit of a trade here, a tactical skirmish, if you will. Uh, Wesley's poking, right? He's poking a little bit, trying to win control of these squares. If you take, there's queen b2 check always, which is what happens, and we have a position like this now. White, you can argue, is a touch better because when these pawns fall, this is an isolated pawn. It can't really move forward. White controls that very well. But black is defending everything. Black has very good activity. And uh, Wesley, you know, it's a two-minute game. Magnus gives away the pawn to apply a little bit of pressure. And Wesley, actually, if you count the numbers, he is a pawn up. But his pawn up is right there. And that pawn's not really intimidating anybody. It's not intimidating anybody to the point that Magnus can trade all the pieces. And, you know, under traditional circumstances... This is bad, but um, Magnus has this pawn under control. That pawn's not moving anywhere. You don't want to play rook d3, though. You don't want to play rook d3 and do this because now white is winning. White is just going to push the rook back with the pawn. You don't want to play like that. If you're trying to win here, you want a rook trade. But if you're trying to draw, you, uh, you do what Magnus is doing, which is only trade the rooks if the pawns are going to be split because now you can actually create weaknesses. Look at how active Magnus is. And white's rook is very passive. And here Wesley was, uh, was really, you know... Was, uh, was really, really hesitant, moving the king back and forth like this physically, and it's a draw. They both play at 98.9% .9 accuracy and nothing to choose between them in the first game. But an interesting opening experiment there from Wesley So Now, what is going to be Magnus's first move? Well, Magnus plays the English. So Magnus actually completely happy to enter a reverse Sicilian. Okay, this is very clever. Um... Because c4, e5 is the, I mean, it's the reverse Sicilian, except basically white is playing the Sicilian defense, but with an extra move. So we have a main line, we have the four knights, and now we have g3, trying to put the bishop on the g2 square. The most principled way to play here is to attack the center right away. It's very forcing, and it, uh, it immediately opens up the position. The bishop goes to g2 to apply pressure when everything is going to open up. And then Magnus plays knight f6. Excuse me, Wesley plays knight f6. Knight f6 is an interesting move. Generally, the knight has been going here. And then bishop e7, f6, bishop e6, oh, bishop e6. But bringing the knight back to that square is unique. Uh, that is definitely not the most popular move. Magnus castles, and Wesley plays this move h6. So the black knight goes there, and then there, and then back, and then black plays h6. I mean, it just looks like black doesn't know how to play chess. I mean, it just looks like black never really learned opening principles or anything. So that's weird. But the point is that it's actually quite difficult for white to develop. If white plays d3 here, which looks very natural, you're not ever putting the bishop on g5 or f4, so I'm not really sure how you're going to develop, right? 
But d3 is definitely an option. Magnus plays a3. Very simple idea of a3, my friends, is he would like to go b4. And then he would like to play b5, and also this, and also this. So, Wesley says you're not playing b4. I'm making a committal pawn move, but I see that you want to expand. Magnus says, all right, if I can't play b4, I'll play b3. Fine. And then I'm going to play bishop b2. And Wesley plays bishop d6. And here, Magnus reconsiders... And he plays d4, spends a little bit of time, but he realizes Magnus, uh, excuse me, he realizes Wesley blocked the queen. Had Wesley gone, let's say, to e7, uh, then Magnus would have probably played bishop b2. You know, Wesley might have castled. And then Magnus would have played d3 and gotten this type of position. But he decides in the face of bishop d6 with this blocked, he no longer wants the slow play. He actually wants to open up the position, which is a move that he did not have available to him a moment ago. Now, the interesting thing about bishop d6 is you would think white wants the bishop. You would actually think white wants to go grab this. That's a bad move because e4, you suddenly take your eyes off the center and you start realizing there are lots of tactics on your rook. Knight d6, queen d6, your knight has zero equity in the center of the board. It's got to go here, and before you know it, uh, yeah, you got a bunch of bozos here that never woke up from their bunkers to go to battle. So that's not going to work. So instead of that, instead of that, we have d4, castles... Wesley plays e4, and he uh, grabs the pawn in the center. Magnus takes the pawn in e4 and trades, and we have the following position where Magnus is down six minutes on the clock. Clearly, something has not gone fully correct here. Uh, now, if he wants to play knight d5, it is possible to try to grab the bishop, but he can't rush with the move knight d5 because after knight f3 check, I completely give away my knight, but I get your bishop, and that's an issue. There's all sorts of tactics here on the white position. e3... And now a nice move, uh, but a move that gets a completely undeserved brilliant. Like, chess.com, the brilliant feature is very handy in certain situations. This ain't one of them. I wish somebody went in and overruled this as a brilliant move. It's a very straightforward move. It's the same kind of tactic where you try to give away the knight to win that bishop. In this case, you are giving away the knight to get the bishop. And it would, be, uh, it would be a big decision for white to take because, you know, giving away a bishop is a, is a big deal. White could play something like queen c2 here and just, you know, but after take, take, you know, black, black could just take. And, I mean, I still like this position for white just visually, but something like c6 and now you have no targets. But okay, I mean, you still have to play chess, right? Like, if I put two 1400s in that position, they would both lose. They would both find a way to lose. Knight takes b5, bishop takes b2, Magnus trades queens and then plays knight takes c7. After a long, grinding series of moves, Wesley is a pawn down, but he's trying to win the pawn back. And if Magnus tries to run away, there's rook d3. Not rook d4, I just can't draw arrows. Rook d3 and bishop e6, and that pawn is going to perish. So we have knight b6 and opposite colored bishops, but uh, this one's ending in a draw. Opposite colored bishops, but... Nothing to choose. I mean, white is a pawn up, but if you just do the math, what's going to happen is these four will simplify into one versus zero. These two cancel out because there's literally no way for white to break through. And then at the end, black, black would sacrifice for the last pawn. And sadly, you cannot checkmate with king and a bishop versus a king, even if you tried to lose as hard as possible. So Wesley defends himself, and this is just the position that you absolutely cannot lose. Magnus pokes a little bit, but... Wesley's pawns are in dark squares. There's absolutely nothing. Last game was 98.9 versus 98.9. This one is 99.2 versus 99.3. Nothing to choose between these guys. Now, the next game is interesting. The next game is interesting. I had predicted when this match started, Wesley would not play e4, and Wesley would play d4 instead. And Wesley ultimately played b3. So he played ni neither of those moves, but he avoided the main line. Well, this game, he plays e4. And I thought Wesley might want to ease his way into the match. He didn't. I mean, he played d4. He played b3, but it was still very, you know, solid. And the reason I thought that is I thought that Magnus would play a Sicilian defense against e4. I thought Magnus would want to fight from game one because Wesley is, a, is, a, is kind of like slow, methodical, solid. He kind of wants to ease into the match, and I thought Magnus would want to start a fight. Well, lo and behold, the second that Wesley played e4 in game number three c5 knight to f3 and now not knight c6 which is magnus's most common sicilian not d6 which would go into a knight or for a dragon or other main lines not e6 to play a con like he did against fabiano or a taimanov none of that stuff magnus carlson played the o kelly variation of the sicilian defense 
you put this thing into a computer and it says plus 0.6 off the bat. Like Stockfish thinks this is a huge waste of time. Actually, the O'Kelly variation is something I would highly recommend for higher intermediate players, especially those that play a lot of over-the-board chess, because the traditional main line for white in an open Sicilian is to go here, and against the O'Kelly, it's just bad. Like, black gets to play e5 and knight f6, and black gets a great position. So, the O'Kelly is a really nice opening to add to your toolbox, but traditionally, c3, d4 gives white an advantage, uh, or c4 right away and knight c3, and you delay the move d4 for a little while. That's traditional knowledge. But of course, if Magnus plays something, you can't just say, hey, that's not very good. You can't play that. So Magnus uh, looking for a fight off the bat. And Wesley plays bishop e2. So you'll notice Wesley also spent a minute on that move. A minute and like 20 seconds because he gets bonus time. So obviously, this is a surprise. And he does not play the two main lines. Like, you either play c3 or c4 here if you want an advantage. You know what Wesley does? Wesley waits for a committal move, which is d6, and then plays d4 and this. And bishop e2 is an interesting move. I mean, it's, it, it's definitely a line. It's definitely a very flexible move, and, and, and it's a move that forces black to commit one of the pawns. Because black can't play d5 here. This would just be a, you know, this would just be a really terrible Scandinavian. White would just have a tremendous amount of development. So, d6... Well, queen, not even not, queen d4. That's interesting. Look at that. And he brings the queen back voluntarily. And I guess he's going to develop and castle queen side. Now, the computer really likes queen e3. I've played, uh, I've played this myself, actually. Um, I've, I've played variations where I put the queen on the uh, e3 square instead of the d3 square. But that's all to say Wesley puts his queen on the d squ d3 square. And here Wesley surprised me again because rather than playing knight c3 and bishop g5 and potentially opposite side castling, he, he just goes for just a very kind of solid standard, okay, queen slightly active, uh, you know, queen is slightly out there, uh, Sicilian. And um, now he just, he has to play chess, but it's same side castling. So does unhealthy, but sometimes, you know, you, you, you don't have the patience, it's the only thing that's around, and you need a little bit of a sugar boost. But um, everything in moderation. That is, my, that is my life philosophy. Knight to d5. The idea of this move is to put pressure on the black position and also to play c3, which would control this knight as well as block the bishop, and then white would play bishop g5. There, there actually is a variation uh, of the Sicilian defense that is very, very similar. Magnus has a setup that's kind of, kind of, well, that was weird. I don't know why I went Australian there for a second. Kind of. Um, speaking of Australian, Alexander Volkanovsky is going to be in Las Vegas for that press conference um, for UFC 297, 8, and 9, as well as a bunch of other fighters. I'm very excited for UFC 296 as a side note, but um, that Colby Covington line that he said to Leon Edwards, I have never been more offended on behalf of another person at a press conference. I mean, I was just, I could not believe he said that. Like, there is, I was just going to say, sorry, if you're not a, 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 a fight fan, I, I could not believe that that man said that. That, that was crazy. I, shock. B5, and, and uncomfortable for me personally. But that's why I'm not a fighter. That's why I'm sitting in a hotel room talking about chess players. So, Bishop G5, I just said this was the idea. Knight E5, and we have a horseless game. It's, it's two guys that definitely would not be equestrians. Um, or, maybe, or maybe even date equestrians. I mean, my goodness, they, they hate horses. Look at this. No horses in this game. Uh, but, 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 but Wesley plays H4. Wesley, a principled man, plays pawn to h4. Actually, th these types of positions demand a little bit of a4, like a little bit of a4 business. Wesley clearly indicates to Magnus that he wants to attack. Magnus says he he is not afraid. He does not care that he has to put, put pawns in front of his king forward. He shuts Wesley down. And even still, Wesley should be instigating on the queen side. That is what he should be doing because those pawns are advanced. Like, Magnus unquestionably would find a way to play a4. My Magnus might even play a4 in this position right off the bat. I haven't spoken to him about this, but <clears throat> maybe if I do, uh, we'll, we'll put it in the next interview. Interview is coming out soon. Very excited for, for all of you to see that. Now, the bishops have tension here, and you'll notice Wesley has completely turned his attention away from the queen side. Plus, he's being tentative, right? Five, six minutes for both. Here comes Magnus, arriving on the fourth rank, basically saying to Wesley, look, man, if you don't want to attack me, if you feel uncomfortable forcing the issue in our game, allow me to do so, because I'm not going to sit around here making draws with you all day. I have $200,000 to win. 
and a Maple Leafs game to go to where they're going to trail 5 nothing, make a comeback, and then lose. He really did that. He was at that game. King G7, King G2, and look, Wesley's queenside, which was his greatest asset in this game. We go back to the moment that Wesley played H4. The queenside is where White could have caused the most problems with a move like A4, throwing the black position into a little bit of a state of disarray. And yet we fast forward to the 24th move of the game, and it is Wesley so expecting the arrival of the black position, playing more defensively as Magnus has now seized control of the game and both of them are ticking down to three minutes. Now, the good news for Wesley is the position is still very much in the balance. Magnus throws in a Zvichenzug, an in-between move before moving his bishop back, and we have a queen and rook endgame. Now, it's very unclear with time ticking if these pawns are assets or liabilities. I'm inclined to believe that the with the side that is actually able to create attacks against one of the pawns probably is looking at it being a liability. Nobody in White's position can attack that pawn. I mean, unless you suck at chess and play rookie six. And that is not a rook sacrifice. You cannot say you are sacrificing pieces when you are losing them. Please stop doing that. It is a coping mechanism for your inadequacies as a chess player. Rook to d4 defense. And now Black is going to try to poke over here or potentially over here. But Wesley doing a nice job. There's really not a whole lot Magnus can do. We are looking at a Rook endgame. Uh, Magnus immediately takes control but, of the file, but just Rook d2. And, and, and a nice idea g5 here, by the way. Very nice idea. Trying to sacrifice a pawn, get the king in the game. Wesley goes here. Um... And then plays this curious move. Now, <clears throat> Magnus actually has a terrible pawn structure. Doubled F-pawns never really impressed anybody. And the king can't really get out. But the king's going that way. And... Wesley just loses his F-pawn. I mean, it was very difficult for him to defend the entire position. But he's just going to lose a pawn. And now desperate times call for desperate measures. And apparently this was not correct, and, the, and, and by marching his king up, Wesley says, I'm down a pawn, but these pawns are so bad, they don't even count for one. You got two pawns, and they literally count for nothing because you can't do anything to my position. Well, the good news is, Magnus can't break through. The, Magnus goes for the d2 pawn, here comes Wesley, and now we're going to have a grand old exchange of pawns. We're going to get rook f2 check, f5, rook c2, and all the pawns are going to fly off the board. The king goes back for that pawn, rook c3, king f5, and we're going to trade everything down, rook b4, and... Um, First, Wesley plays this, which I do I do really like, monitoring that pawn. Magnus plays rook b1, and um, in this position, Wesley has to go king f6. Wesley actually should not go for that pawn, ironically, but utilize his really strong king to get to the f7 pawn. The idea here is that after the move b4, you have check here, and then you take like this. You actually should go for that pawn first. Because Black's not going to be able to defend this pawn and cause you problems. The second Black goes here, suddenly Black is losing another pawn. So that's the issue. Instead of that, Wesley grabs on h5. And in the scramble, he just can't stop both pawns. And with less than five seconds on this clock, by the thinnest margin, rook g1 check. And if the king goes there, it's a queen with check. If king here, it's a check. And then here, and Magnus wins. Out of nowhere, a scramble of a rook endgame where a mistake was made 40 to 50 moves in the game just after a series of kind of passive, hesitant moves and just sort of, you know, just, just sort of a little bit, a little bit too, a little bit too reserved, you know? This is not the Wesley who we saw absolutely decapitate Magnus Carlsen's king in the Armageddon game. You remember that a couple days ago? Mag he literally sacrificed everything. You're not going to get two games like that against Magnus in like four days. But it's still, you know, and, and, and now Wesley has to win with black. Wesley's got to win with black. He, that, that's, what, that's what he's got to do. I mean, there's no better opening to play if you're going to play for a win with black. Sicilian defense with c5, but Magnus taking all the, all the air out of the room. He just plays the move c3. The Alapin Sicilian, which is a very forcing variation that could potentially, you know, cause very quick transformations in the position. And, 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 and this is, I mean, this is really like, if you want to make a Sicilian defense player fall asleep... You play the Alep and you make them real, real sleepy. Uh, knight f3, d6, but Wesley plays queen d4, which is actually, I, I believe we saw Hikaru play this earlier in the event against Maxim Vachelagrav. Um, instead of playing the, the main line, which I think is bishop c4 in some positions, queen d4, and then bishop c4 is played, so white keeps the queen side a certain way. Did I say Wesley plays queen takes d4? I keep mixing up their names. I think I just need more sleep. Called Matt Galloway, Matt Turner. Like, I don't even... Gallo, wait, they don't even have any of the same. That was, I don't know why I did that. 
ed queen d6 and this is the position so this is what magnus has to work with he brings his knight into the game good principled now he brings the queen back he brings the queen back so that it's not a target for black's pieces notice that he spent only about 20 seconds on that move he wants to go here he's also kind of trying to induce wesley into knight f4 Obviously, he thought his queen was snug on the f1 square. The computer hates it. I mean, Stockfish is sitting here going, I don't know why you would ever put your queen on the f1 square. But he senses hesitancy. You gotta remember, Magnus now has three games of information of this match, and, 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 and Wesley's been a bit hesitant. So Wesley backs up, which makes sense. He's opening up the rook, and then he puts his bishop on the diagonal, and Wesley's a little bit better here. But what does that even mean? <laughs> like, right, okay, it's one thing if Stockfish tells you minus 0.5, a6 is a nice move, you know, maybe black has to play knight d5. Black is going to maybe slowly roll in here with his pawns. Maybe he has to trade a couple of important pieces. Rook d1, Magnus just wants exchanges. <clears throat> Wesley uh, apparently should be trading first and then playing bishop b7 because after takes, takes, and then bishop b7, this rook is not yet committed anywhere. And uh, it's actually tough for white to make a move. Like, let's say white plays h3. Black just begins firing without even moving this rook because the a6 pawn is weak. Uh, in the other line. So, for example, <coughs> you, you notice that black can't play rook d8 because of this diagonal. So, instead of the way it happened, uh, in this position, Wesley, I guess, should have taken on d1, then bishop b7, then knight e5, but he does it this way. He's still up two and a half minutes, but Magnus is just trading off black's pieces, like black is running out of firepower. So, b5, rook d8, a very nice position. Trust me, this position looks really nice. And on top of that, white only has a minute and 48 seconds. The only issue is, white is Magnus Carlsen. So, it's like, are you going to get him into a, into a better endgame for black and grind him down? I mean, I think Magnus would potentially enjoy that, right? Knight, knight d4, queen e2, bishop e2, and that's exactly where we're headed. Wesley could have tried to preserve the queens, uh, but the only real way to do that was, like, again, if Wesley plays something like Queen G5, White is going to trade a whole lot more than just those pieces. He's going to get all of this. And if you wanted, you could play H5, which is a very interesting move. H5 is a very interesting move. I almost feel like Magnus would have played H5 himself. I actually feel like if this position was Magnus was black, he might play a move like H5. It's a very, very annoying move for White, because now if you want to trade queens, one pawn dominates three, and it leaves White with a very uncomfortable position over there. You notice the computer really doesn't like it. After the move H5, the computer actually, like, in, in many cases, wants to break the staring contest, or even, like, weaken the king to kick the queen out. So it really doesn't like the move h5 for white, but instead we go to an endgame, and Magnus basically just says, the fists up, elbows tucked, head between, like, like, and he just says, let's go. Let's go. It's two to one. So, I mean, w Wesley has to win this endgame with black. He's got a minute and 19 seconds, and Magnus has a minute. Can Magnus get it done? I, can Wesley get it done? Will Magnus defend himself? King f1, down to 39 seconds. Magnus says, all right, come and get me. You want to double my? You, you want to damage my structure? Come and get me. Wesley plays g6, preventing anything from going to f5. Maybe he's going to walk his king. Maybe he's going to bring his pawns. Right? That's what he's going to do. Magnus walks the king to the home square. He says, "What's up, Rook? I'm here. I'm defending. Anything else you got?" Well, the truth is, it's very difficult to make progress here. You can play bishop b6. You can play bishop d5. You can dance, but at some point, you can dance. You can dance. Everybody. Blah, blah, blah. E5. E5. And now we go to a minor piece endgame. So Wesley's really, really trading everything. Magnus ASAP going for knight versus bishop. What? I mean, I mean, Matt Wesley, Matt, I've been mixing up the names the whole recap. But uh, this is a very difficult position to win. King f8, Magnus controlling these pawns, not letting them move, and uh, play c4. And apparently now, even in the endgame, this, this is the craziest part about this game, Magnus needs to literally sit there and do nothing. He needs to just kind of wait. But he's forcing the issue. Like, despite being in a situation where he does not need to play for a win, he's still the one calling the shots. He's still the one trying to trade and target weaknesses or, you know, take with the knight and target the bishop. And the computer does not bless this move. It wants bishop e6, where it thinks that after bishop takes and then king takes, even though c5 is appearing on the board... This pawn is actually closer to the black king than it was before. Black, I mean, I'm sure the game is still going to end in a draw, but my point is that it's a lot of psychology. Like, the move c4 is a pure psychological decision, 
And he also might have thought it was the best move. And Wesley blunders right away. He blunders right away. He blunders and he blunders because now knight c4. And after bishop takes, bishop takes, a b4, that's it. It doesn't matter that you're a pawn down. We just saw that opposite colored bishops. It's a draw. We just saw this exact same endgame. And yeah, I mean, Magnus pushes a bunch of pawns. He knows he's not going to lose. The white king is going to go to f3. The bishop targets the pawn. These pawns cancel each other out completely. And that's the end. That is the end. A very tense first day where it seemed like Wesley was a bit tentative, a bit tentative, and Magnus just pounced in game three in that one opportunity, a rook endgame scramble with about 10 seconds remaining on the clock, and that is how Magnus leads the first set. I mean, Magnus has had a couple of close matches, like against Fabiano, but this one was close in a completely different way. We need Wesley tomorrow to show up uh, ready, feral, ready to go, attacking, not physically, uh, because that's going to be the only way to make a comeback in the second set, uh, or else Magnus is once again going to win another chess championship. So um, I'm going to go get some food. I will see you all for the last round tomorrow. Get out of here.